Hello everyone, this is Dror Chawin from Tel Aviv University in Israel. Uh, today I'd like to present new lower bounds on the time memory trade-off of function inversion. This is joint work with my thesis advisor Yiftah Heitner and fellow researcher Noam Azor. First, let's describe the problem. Function inversion is basically given a function and an image of the function y, find some x which is mapped by f to y. Basically, find the pre-image for y over f. To do so, we are allowed to have some oracle access to f, and we also have access to side information a. So you can actually picture this, uh, uh, this problem as having two phases. In the first phase, the function is given to a preliminary stage, a preprocessor, which then outputs the side information. The side information is given to the online phase, the decoder, which is then uh, is given a, a y, an image, at random, and can communicate with the function f using an oracle, and hopefully outputs a value in the pre-image of y. Uh, we only require this to succeed with high probability over random choice of f and y, where f is chosen uniformly at random from the set of all functions from n to n, and y is simply the is the image of a uniformly chosen input to f. Now, uh, we don't assume anything about the computation is not bounded, basically. Uh, in particular, the preprocessor is unbounded in time and space. However, we do have two interesting parameters in this question, question which do uh, provide certain lower bounds. The first is the advice length, s. This is basically... Um, this functions as a lower bound on the amount of space needed to perform the inversion. And we also have Q, which is the number of queries performed by the decoder in the online phase. And this is an effective lower bound on the time requirements of the algorithm. Uh, another variant of this problem exists, which is non-adaptive function inversion. The basic problem is the same, except that now all of the queries must be performed in bulk at once. To do that, we introduced introduced um, an intermediate phase, the query selection phase. The query selection algorithm also has access to the side information, the advice string, as well as to the value y which we wish to invert. It then outputs a series of indices um, which are the queries for f. Next, in the online phase, when we wish to invert y, the decoder knows y, it, he also knows uh, the advice string a, and the is also given the responses, the answers of the queries by f. And again, as before, outputs a value which is hopefully in the pre-image of y. Now, every non-adaptive algorithm is by definition also an adaptive algorithm. So naturally, any non-adaptive upper bound for inversion also applies to adaptive inversion. And the opposite is also true that any lower bound on adaptive inversion naturally extends to non-adaptive inversion. Next, this, uh, this problem is interesting because of several reasons. First of all, uh, many crypto systems in used in practice today actually, they are analyzed under the assumption that the underlying hash or cipher function are ideal, that is they behave like a random function. Uh, so basically any attacks which are possible for the function inversion are also possible for uh, real case uses of uh, cryptographic hash functions and ciphers. Next, we also have black box separations, which basically can treat a one-way function as a black box, and uh, the function inversion problem also explores the capabilities, what we can or cannot do using this model. Uh, finally, another interesting uh, result that has been recently published is non-adaptive lower bounds can imply new Boolean uh, uh, circuit lower bounds, which are so far out of our reach. So that can also be interesting for some of you. Now let's start by reviewing what we've known all along. Upper bounds, that is algorithms, we've got the trivial inverters. For example, I can simply query the entire function until I find the good preimage, and I don't even have to use advice for that. Or I can do the opposite, I can just uh, keep the entire function in my advice string, but I, then I don't have to query the function. Uh, 
at all, then Q can be, can be zero, basically. And I can also do like a trade-off between the two. For example, I keep half, the, half of the function in the advice and I query the other half if the need arises. Now, in particular to the adaptive case, we have one very successful algorithm, first described by Martin Hellman and later on developed, uh, developed on by Fiat and Noel. This allows actually nice trade-offs between space and time, and this admits the possibility of both space as well as time being sublinear in N. And in particular, for the case of a permutation, uh, an even better trade-off is achievable where both S and Q can, for example, be square root of N. However, for the non-adaptive case, absolutely no non-trivial upper bound is known, which is interesting. Now, for the lower bounds, we have a single interesting bound. This is Yao's bound. This, this bound is actually uh, tight for adaptive uh, permutation inversion, as described uh, in the previous slide. And of course, this bound applies actually to both adaptive and non-adaptive inversion. Uh, in the adaptive case, there is still a gap, a certain gap between the best upper bound for functions, not for permutations. Uh, and we actually are not sure which one is the correct, is the correct bound. Um, and that remains to be seen. But for the non-adaptive case, there is a huge gap. And we believe, we believe this gap exists because, as we've just mentioned, um, any new lower bounds which improve on Yao's bound actually imply new circuit lower bounds, which are groundbreaking. All right, so uh, let's review our results in this paper. To start with, uh, let's see how we formulate uh, adaptive inversion. An inverter, we describe it as an algorithm pair. We have a preprocessor and a decoder. We start with the preprocessor, which receives the function and outputs an advice string. Next, the decoder receives the advice string, the element to invert y, and can make at, mo at most uh, q queries to f. We say such an algorithm has high success probability if over random choice of f and y, it succeeds in at least half of cases. But this uh, constant is not actually important, it's quite arbitrary. Now, to produce a lower bound, we made a further assumption on how this uh, algorithm operates. Suppose such an algorithm has linear advice. What does it mean? Linear advice basically means that given any functions f and g, suppose we have the advice of f and the advice string for g, we can use both strings, we can combine them to figure out the advice for another function, f plus g. f plus g, that is coordinate-wise group operation, could be anything actually, as long as it's coordinate-wise. And the plus over on the right side could actually be any operation. It's not, uh, doesn't have to be, to behave like addition, as long as we can figure out the left-hand side from uh, the two elements on the right-hand side. So our bound for this case is suppose there is such an, 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 um, an algorithm, inversion algorithm, then and it's, it has linear advice and it's also successful. Then basically, either its advice or its queries must be at least order of n over log n, which uh, matches, basically matches the, tri the trivial upper bound. Um, all right. Now, the next, the next, uh, this proof, uh, we prove this by reduction from test set disjointness. Uh, you will see this briefly. We have another case, very similar to the first. It naturally extends to the case of additive advice, which is basically any case where given uh, the two functions f and g, we can figure out a way with uh, little communication to compute the advice of the sum f plus g. So basically the previous theorem is just a private case of this one. Here we, it states that either the communication required to compute the combined advice or the number of queries must be at least order of n over log n. Now our next result uh, pertains to non-adaptive inversion. And this time the constraint lies on the decoder phase, not the preprocessor. But first of all, let's uh, define non, let's formulate non-adaptive inversion. 
Here we use a triplet of algorithms. We have the preprocessor, the query selector, and the decoder. The preprocessor, as before, receives the functions and output, outputs and uh, advice string. The query selector receives the advice string and the element we wish to invert and outputs a series of queries, which are then given to the decoder. The decoder uh, is given the advice string and the element to invert and in conjunction with the query results must output an answer. Uh, and this time we concentrate on a very limited kind of decoder, an affine decoder, that is uh, given any fixed values for y and a, the output of the decoder must behave like an affine function over the function f, if we treat f as a vector. Here we assume that uh, this all happens over a finite field, and, and here the inner product between some vector and f where f the function is simply treated as a vector. Now our result for this kind of uh, decoder is basically that regardless of how many queries it uses, and given that, given the caveat that the size of the field must equal n, then the advice used by the algorithm must be at least order of n, which again basically closes the gap with the trivial upper bound. This is actually quite a degenerate inverter, it can do much, but the reason it is interesting is because it actually allows us uh, to modify it and then uh, yield bounds which are more, more interesting for more complex decoders, which is done in the next slide. Now, on to our final result, which is uh, similar to the previous ones, the previous one except a slightly more advanced decoder. Here, our decoder is not an affine decoder, but rather an affine decision tree decoder. This time, uh, for any given y and a, the decoder outputs a function which behaves like a decision tree over values of f, over affine functions of f. For example, you can see here there's a, just like a toy, toy decision tree. Uh, the path is determined by the values of affine functions of f, and these functions, these alphas and betas, are all determined uniquely by y and a. This is interesting because d here is the depth of the tree, and using different depths we can actually uh, create a, an entire spectrum of complexity of the decoder. For example, when d is equal to 1, that is basically, that reduces to the previous case, just having a single affine computation over the values of f, and can't do much. However, if I increase d uh, by as little as 1, now d equals 2, that is already enough to perform multiplication and also a single pointer jump between the different queries. And if I take it to the extreme, for example, d equals q, then this basically uh, can uh, describe any arbitrary non-adaptive inverter, which is the general case and the most interesting. Uh, and the result is as follows. Given uh, such an inverter with high success probability and a d-depth uh, affine decision tree decoder, then uh, if the field size, again, must be of size n, then uh, we have some interesting uh, uh, lower bound on the size of the advice. And this actually, we can split it into separate cases. For example, if uh, the number of queries is linear in n, then we can say that s must be at least order of n over d log n. And if q is uh, sublinear in n, then s must, must be at least n over d. And in the case where q, where d equals q, that is the arbitrary, um, arbitrary non-adaptive decoder, we find that in this case actually uh, this simply reconstructs uh, Yao's bound. And just one comment about the field size: this result can still hold for somewhat smaller fields than n, uh, with some tweaking. We didn't really address this in our paper while for much smaller fields this isn't an interesting question in the first place. For larger fields we believe this does hold, but we have yet to show it. Alright, so now let's go on to prove our first theorem of linear advice adaptive inverters. Now let's just uh, recap for a moment what the bound was. We, we require that the preprocessing phase uh, behave under this constraint where the sum of 
of two devices equals to, this, to the device of the sum of the functions. And the sum could be any coordinate-wise sum between the functions. Um, and we, re we use reduction from a classical problem called set disjointness. I guess you know it, but I'll just, just describe it briefly. Uh, given two parties, Alice and Bob, each is given uh, an input set, x and y. Now, two parties may communicate a certain number of bits, and they wish to answer the question, are our sets disjoint? And the seminal, uh, the seminal uh, result of Rasborov showed that any randomized, even randomized or not randomized protocol which decides set disjointness must use at least order of n bits of communication between the two parties. And this holds even under the more specific case where both sets are exactly of size n over 4 and the intersection is either empty or contains just a single element. And this also holds even when we allow a small error. So let's see our reduction. So here we assume these two parties, they each have an input set, x and y. They're interested in figuring out whether, they are, whether or not they are disjoint. And in their possession, they have a linear advice inversion algorithm, C. Now, uh, first of all, Alice uses her own set x to define the function fx. This function is defined as follows. For each i in the set, fx of i is 0. For each i not in the set, fx of i is chosen uniformly at random. Bob does the exact same thing with his own input set y. Now, uh, Alice computes the advice string for her own function and sends it to Bob. Bob computes the advice string for his own function, adds it to the advice he receives from Alice, and then he, then he basically has in his possession the device for the sum of the functions, even though he doesn't have the actual uh, access to this new function. Now, the next step, Bob takes our inverter C and emulates it and tries to invert the new function F, which is the sum of both individual functions, at the value 0. So now we're trying to find uh, a value which is mapped by this F to 0. Now, while Bob is running this, uh, is simulating this uh, uh, inversion algorithm, every time he receives a query from the algorithm, he simply asks Alice. Alice, Alice uh, replies with her own value, and Bob, Bob adds, his, adds it to his own fy of k, which is, by definition, equal to f of k. And then he feeds it back to the algorithm. Eventually, the algorithm finishes and outputs a value w. Now Bob communicates W to Alice and they both check whether or not W exists in the intersection between both sets. And of course, if it does exist in the intersection, then they say that the sets are not disjoint. If it does, if it is not in the intersection, then they say the sets are disjoint. Now, before I convince you that this does make sense and that this is correct, let's just see how much communication we've used here. Now, first of all, Alice sent S bits for the advice. Next, for each query, we had two log n bits, so 2k, 2q log n, and it doesn't require much to figure out the last stage. Okay, now let's let's see that this is actually correct. First observation to make is there is only one sided error in this uh, protocol. For example, if there is no value which belongs to both sets then there will never be a w that will make uh, Alice and Bob output that sets are not disjoint because of the last stage. So the, pro the error can only be one way. The second key observation is that suppose there exists some element i in both sets, then by definition f of i must equal 0. Why is that? Because i, is, I belongs to x, so f x of i is 0, f y of i is also 0, Therefore, the sum of both, which is f of i, is also 0. And uh, the rationale is that now, suppose Bob manages to find uh, a preimage for 0 over this function f, then hopefully uh, we will get this element i, which exists in both sets, and then we can figure out the sets are not disjoint. Now, 
suppose uh, what if C fails doesn't give a correct answer? Well, we can simply amplify by repeating this uh, protocol several times. Next, another problem, suppose C does return uh, a valid pre-image for zero, but does not return that correct i, just a random other value, which is possible since these functions are quite random. Well, this doesn't happen with high probability because the pre-image of zero for this function is actually expected to be of constant size, even as n grows. That means that by repeating this uh, protocol a sufficient number of times, we have pretty good, uh, pretty good probability of coming up with the single correct i, which does exist in both sets. And of course, this is uh, treated in more, more formally in the paper, and it's quite simple. Next, another uh, few problems is that uh, the function f should behave completely uniformly, which it doesn't right now. Also, we always wish to invert at zero, and the answer uh, is also determined by x and y if the sets are not disjoint. And this can also be easily fixed. Um, you can simply open the paper, but it's not very interesting. And finally, we also need to prove that every iteration of the protocol uh, is independent of the others, and we also show that in the paper we do some very simple tricks to uh, ensure that happens. So in total, what happened here is we assumed the existence of such an algorithm C, and we've employed it to solve the set disjointness problem using uh, not that many bits of information. And this follows by Rasborough that the either the advice or the number of queries must be at least order of n over log n. All right, so now just to finish off, uh, I'll give a few words on our second result on non-adaptive uh, inverters with fine decoding. Uh, just to recall the result, uh, given such uh, uh, an inverter where the decoder behaves like an affine function of f and has high success probability, uh, it requires at least a linear amount of advice, which is almost a description of the entire function. And the main lemma on which the proof hinges is as follows. We use uh, an inverter D, which has a fixed advice or a zero length advice, but it still has an affine decoder. And we define a few uh, random variables. F is the function chosen for inversion. Y from one to whatever are various challenges which we try to invert using D, and the x's for any i are these outputs on the various y. So we like choose a, choose a function at random and we have this uh, zero advice inverter and we give it different y values and at each time it outputs an x value. Next we define the event zi, which means that from one to i we've succeeded doing all, all of the first i inversions actually, all of them succeeded. D managed to find a proper pre-image. And the main, ma main lemma itself is as follows. Even when conditioned on previous i minus one successes, there is still not such a good chance that we are able to, uh, to invert the i-th ith challenge. And this, this constant is not, uh, is not uh, very important. It's quite arbitrary. And this holds even for quite large values of i. And if qi, if the queries basically are independent of the elements asked at each stage, then it's quite easy to use a information theoretical argument or a probabilistic argument to show that it's quite obvious, this lemma. But they are dependent, and this is the, the, actually the hard part. And we also mentioned that for adaptive inverters in general, this is false. And our proof, it exploits the linearity of the decoder. It basically, what it does is um, finds uh, a linear equation over, over the random variable f, which is implied by this conditioning. So this conditioning is actually translated to a linear equation, an affine equation actually, over f. And next we show that this equation does not supply enough information about f to find any particular pre-image for yi, for the ith challenge. Right, and just to finish off, uh, let's uh, do like a short summary. Uh, 
we've shown new bounds on adaptive inversion with linear or additive advice, non-adaptive inversion with affine decoding, and non-adaptive inversion with affine decision tree decoding. Um, some main open questions that remain is uh, how can we deal with like arbitrary non-adaptive or adaptive inverters since uh, there's still a lot of, uh, there's still a huge gap for the, for the arbitrary case. Also, how about random permutation for non-adaptive inverters? Because in the adaptive case, we do find that there is a difference. And finally, also to find better time memory trade-offs for other cryptographic primitives, uh, which can also use this. So uh, thank you very much for listening, and you're welcome to check out our paper. I hope you enjoy it and that it's clear for you. And have a good day.